Today on At The Forefront Live, you Chicago Medicine Comer Children's Pediatric Specialist will discuss the best way to manage food and seasonal allergies. Does the COVID-19 pandemic impact allergies? When do patients need to be concerned about a baby's symptoms that could be food allergies? And how do video visits work when allergy health care is needed? Dr. Christine Chacho and Dr. Timothy Santango will answer your questions, and that's coming up right now on At The Forefront Live. And we want to remind our viewers that today's program is not designed to take the place of a visit with your physician. Let's start out and have each of you introduce yourselves and tell us what you do here at UChicago Medicine. And, and Dr. Santago, you're on set, so we'll start with you. Hello, my name is Dr. Timothy Santango. I'm Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Chicago. I also direct pediatric nutrition support and I also direct pediatric gastrointestinal endoscopy. So my areas of interest are really nourishing children who are ill and obviously helping children with gastrointestinal problems um, uh, uh, tolerate their foods and grow. Thank you very much. Perfect. And Dr. Chacho? Hi, I'm Dr. Christina Chacho. I'm an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Medicine at the University of Chicago. I also serve as the Section Chief of Allergy Immunology and Pediatric Pulmonology. Um, I also direct the food allergy program and have an interest in caring for both children and adults with food allergy, asthma, and other allergic diseases. So let's jump right into the questions, and we're going to start off with uh, kind of some general COVID-19 questions. And, and Dr. Chacho, I want to start with you on this one. Are there symptoms of food or seasonal allergies that, may, that mimic some of the COVID-19 symptoms? And if so, what should parents be aware of? That's a great question because this can get confusing, particularly in a high pollen season like we're having right now. So you, many people and many of your viewers probably know that the, the tree pollen and grass pollen counts are both very high um, and can uh, mimic an upper respiratory infection. There are some key differences though that I would recommend paying attention to. Uh, one, first and foremost, is that uh, allergies do not cause a fever um, at any time. So if you have a fever, um, that is a reason to suspect an infectious illness and to um, contact your doctor about what to do. Uh, you should also not feel short of breath from allergies unless you have asthma as well. Uh, allergies, however, are very specific in that it causes a lot of itch. So if your eyes are swelling and are very itchy or if your nose is itchy and sneezing, that's really more indicative of an allergy than it is of COVID. So Dr. Santago, you are a nutrition expert and I imagine you also work with, with patients who have food allergies. What should uh, parents be aware of in that area? And, and do parents need to worry about COVID-19 for their kids? Because we've heard a lot in the, in the news reports that maybe the, the COVID-19 situation is, well, it's more severe for adults, but kids can get it as well, correct? Uh, yes, uh, kids can get COVID-19, and from everything that we've heard and learned from places where COVID has preceded us is that children, fortunately, are not as symptomatic um, uh, as adults. Uh, children may, uh, may present as maybe a runny nose and some loose stools, and it might not be severe enough for the family to even go and see their doctor. The tip-off might be that there might have been a family member who was sick with the COVID, therefore that might mean that the child may have got a COVID. But uh, clearly it's like an acute symptom, it's a child who was previously well, and then there's now new development of um, uh, maybe a runny nose, a slight cough, and loose tooth. But many times it doesn't get to the level of uh, going to see the doctor in children. We do want to remind our viewers that we are taking your questions for our experts, so just type them in the comment section and we'll try to get to as many as possible over the half hour of our program. And uh, let's, let's launch into uh, some of the questions that we've already received. Food allergies and intolerances in general in children. Kind of curious because it seems like we hear much more about that than we, than we used to. Um, are they on the rise and, and do we know what, what causes that? And I'm not sure, Dr. Chacho, if you want to take that one or start with that one? Sure, this is a, a complicated question. We think uh, most of our data is about what we uh, term IgE-mediated food allergy. 
which means that if a child eats a specific food uh, within 15 minutes, they'll develop um, respiratory distress, swelling, hives. And we do think that food allergy has been on the rise since the 80s, and it's very unclear yet uh, why that is. At the University of Chicago, one of our research programs is looking at how our, uh, the bacteria in our gut may influence this, and if some of the things in our modern society have um, changed the bacteria that live inside us, and maybe that's one of the reasons why some of these things are on the rise. But unfortunately, we just don't know yet, um, so we're doing our best to, to manage uh, food allergies. Um, in kids, and we're coming uh, a long way with new treatments, and we have a lot of different research that is helping us better understand exactly what's going on. Another uh, question from a viewer, can inflammation from allergies make you more susceptible to COVID infection? And Dr. Santango, I don't know if you want to take that one. Uh, not really. Um, COVID infection really across the board could catch anybody who's exposed to it. So um, we do know that there are more, if you have uh, actually more serious illness like uh, your immune suppression, you ha you're immune suppressed, or have other chronic medical problems, weakness of your muscles, then you're going to be sicker. So once again, um, uh, it's, it's regardless of who, what your previous medical health is, you could catch COVID and the symptoms to get the point of seeing a doctor tend to be related to if you have any pre-existing pre uh, medical condition. Another question from a viewer. We're getting a lot so far. This is, this is great. We're off to a good start. Uh, can you discuss IgG versus IgE allergies and how to proceed when you suspect more of an IgG reaction, how to pinpoint what's the trigger, how to avoid medication, uh, and that sort of thing. And, and Dr. Chacha, you want to take that one? Sure, another excellent question. So um, uh, an IgE-mediated allergy, like I mentioned, um, the, the symptoms are very specific. You eat a food and within minutes you have a severe reaction. Um, there's lots of food intolerances and it's different per person. And unfortunately, no matter how hard we've tried, we've never been able to find a good test that can reliably tell us um, a food that you're intolerant to. Uh, there is IgG or IgG4 uh, testing on the market for food allergy, um, but time and time again, it's shown us in research that it, it just doesn't work. It doesn't point us um, in the direction of what may be causing uh, symptoms of food intolerance. Uh, so what I recommend to my patients, and it is the only valid validated way of determining a food intolerance, is uh, to keep a food diary and go um, a, avoid foods that you think you may be intolerant to for about two weeks and see if you have a difference in symptoms. Unfortunately, we just don't have anything more sophisticated than that at this time. Another question from a viewer. My son is having some splotchy redness around his mouth after eating peanut butter on three different occasions. He's only nine months old. How should I proceed? Is he too young to have a true peanut allergy? And, and I have a question because is he too young to be eating peanut butter? Is that uh, um, accurate, Dr. Santango? Um, uh, actually, it's, the times are changing, and I'll defer more to Dr. Chacho. Um, uh, previously, we used to recommend delaying introduction of several foods, but um, uh, right now there's a new understanding that um, uh, children who are prone to allergies seem to do better in the long term if some foods are introduced, obviously, sooner. And uh, I would imagine that uh, the serving is really more of the texture of the food that uh, would determine, but I wouldn't imagine the child would be eating a large serving size. So we, we, the, our, we now are open and encouraging families um, to introduce a variety of foods even sooner to their infants. So that's now becoming less unusual. Is nine months too early to have a peanut allergy though? Um, uh, nine months is, um, maybe I'll defer that to Dr. Chacho. Okay, Dr. Chacho, you wanna take that one? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, nine months is not too early for a food allergy. In fact, we see um, food allergies develop at pretty much any age. Um, and in, we have good evidence now that, um, like Dr. Sintango mentioned, if you um, are at high risk of developing a food allergy, um, and that would include children uh, with eczema or another food allergy to egg, for example, um, early introduction at four to six months of age of a um, 
a peanut product, and we do recommend thinning it, so um, of course infants don't choke, uh, is absolutely appropriate and we recommend they get it on a regular basis and that's highly effective in preventing a food allergy. If your child is having redness around their mouth when they're getting peanut, I do think it's probably time to talk to your primary care doctor or, or an allergist and just make sure um, everything's okay and um, it is a um, reasonable um, uh, a reasonable path forward to keep introducing peanut. Of course, we're hoping very much to keep peanut in children's diet to prevent the long-term outcome of maybe at five or going to school age with a severe anaphylactic peanut allergy. Um, but it, it's um, it's a little bit nuanced, and, and I think. Um, depending on your family history, it's, it's worth talking to a doctor. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Dr. Chacho, because this, this allows me to uh, talk a little bit about video visits and some of the telehealth. And, and you and I were actually talking before the program a little bit about this. That is something that, of course, you Chicago Medicine and Comer Children's is using extensively right now. Uh, and, and you've had a great deal of success. You were uh, relaying some of that uh, experience with me. Uh, before the program. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and, and maybe kind of allay some of the fears that parents might have that are worried about bringing your children, uh, bringing their children rather to, uh, to the hospital? Absolutely. About 70% of our visits right now are being done via video. So um, patients, the families can be at home together. Um, it is also possible if uh, one parent's at work and one parent's at home for them both to come into the video chat separately so we can um, make sure everyone's included in the visit. And um, that's done a few things. Uh, one, uh, sometimes it really just is a talk with the physician and, and that's all that needs to happen. In fact, that happens quite a bit. And uh, the video visit is extremely effective, uh, effective at delivering care. Um, it also has helped reduce the number of patients in our clinic. So we don't have um, full waiting rooms now. We're able to maintain social distancing and we're able to, uh, in a very safe way, bring the families who need to be seen in person back to the rooms, um, in a very much minimizing any risk um, of, of developing a COVID infection. Um, so we've been very pleased how things have been able to progress forward. And um, I think that we have been able to continue to give care to our patients who have chronic diseases. Of course, we don't want to neglect those during this time either. Absolutely. And Dr. Santango, I'm, I'm curious from your standpoint as well, uh, the use of televisits or video visits, uh, how is that working for you? Are, are you pretty pleased with how that's going so far? And also, if uh, the one thing I would like you to talk about as well is if patients really do need to come into Comer Children's, for example, it's very safe here for them to do that. Would that be correct? Yeah, that is very correct. And uh, I'm also very, very amazed and pleased at the way video visits have played out because many families do actually work and understand them very well. It takes a bit of um, arrangement before the visit to make sure that the settings and the passwords are correct because, again, it's confidential information between the physician and their patient. Uh, but patients and families are really are very appreciative of them. And uh, in the encounter, we do, a let, we do let families know that there's a possibility that some assessments may need to be done in person. And if they have to be done in person, um, the visit is coordinated. Uh, as Dr. Chacho has mentioned, there's a walk pathway into the hospital and to the clinics to ensure that there's actual good social distancing. The appointment is set up so that there's minimal waiting and uh, the, uh, the, the encounter happens. So um, both options are available, but obviously right now in this era of uh, social distancing, video visits are the way to go and they are working out amazingly uh, very well. That's fantastic. And mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was interesting because I, I had the opportunity to uh, uh, go into Comer, I think it was last week, and, and again, people are being very cautious. They're taking all of the uh, proper precautions. and. As one of the physicians told me in, in that program, it's probably safer to be here in the hospital than it is you know, just about any place else you could be right now because of the efforts to keep everything clean, the social distancing, everybody's masking in the hospital, uh, and, and being very, very careful. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about um, some of the, uh, uh, here's a new question. I'm going to throw this one at you. So what are you hearing from your patients about the use of, I think it's Palforzia? for peanut allergy, now that it's been a few months since FDA approval, and I don't know which one of you would like to take that one. 
I can take that. We're using that in our clinic. Um, Palforzia is the first FDA-approved um, medication or treatment for food allergy. So we're all very excited to see that happen last January. And what it is is um, that we are. Uh, it's a method to desensitize or do an oral immunotherapy um, for children who have peanut allergy. It's specific to peanuts, so it doesn't cover any other food. Uh, but what we do is we actually start feeding children a very small uh, amount of peanut that's below their level of reactivity, below the amount that we um, think would cause a reaction. And we have them eat that every day. And after about two weeks, they come back and see me again. And if everything looks good, I have them eat just a little bit more. And they eat that amount for two weeks. And that goes on and on for about six months. And after about six months, we find that we can have kids, even with severe peanut allergy, eating a peanut every day. And, and what that uh, um, what that allows is a, a layer of protection. So uh, your family can feel safe going to a baseball game that has peanuts or buying foods that say um, this product is manufactured in a plant that has peanut. Those, those very difficult precautionary labels that we really don't know what to do with. Um, it's worth saying that it's not a cure. Uh, we don't um, expect that your child's peanut allergy will go away completely. It's a layer of safety, but it really is a very nice layer of safety um, for our families to feel confident sending their kids back to school um, and to um, overnights and other things that every kid wants to participate in. And I want to talk about milk allergies in just a moment because we've received quite a few questions. but. Going back to Dr. Santago, your comments about Comer, we have some, some video that we took when we were there last week, and it, it kind of shows uh, a little bit about what, it's, uh, what the situation is like inside uh, Comer right now. And, and again, it's, it's very safe, and you can uh, get an opportunity. Uh, here's Comer right here. Um, it's a beautiful facility, first of all, and, and the work that's uh, done there is fantastic. But uh, we'll go inside in just a moment, and you'll kind of see the parents uh, who are watching this will get an idea of what, uh, uh, what precautions are being taken right now. And one of the things that I noticed immediately when you do enter is that uh, they will uh, stop and greet you uh, and check to see if you have uh, any symptoms potentially of COVID uh, because they want to make sure that, again, the, the patients are, are protected and, and, uh, and uh, all of the family members that are there. So it's, it's really you know, it's, it's, it's well run and it's mm -hmm. a, a very, very safe place to be. I don't know if you have any thoughts on this as we're watching this. No, um, uh, I think it's been well thought through exactly as you said um, uh, to, to, to regulate how people come into the hospital and to make families also be assured that we're also thinking about them first. Um, uh, we understand they're ill, but we also want them to come to a safe environment uh, for them and also for us. So um, I really uh, credit our infectious disease team, control team, who have thought through this. I know they meet regularly to fine tune and clean up any bottlenecks that arise as more and more people come through this way. So I really think it's a very, very strength uh, for the for the institution. Yeah, I was I was amazed when when I was there. Uh, it's you know the their patients are moving through. Uh, they're keeping separated just as they they should be, and it seemed like it was working really well. And the patients seemed to be in a mm -hmm. in a pretty good mood as they were going through it because, of course, they understand that this is very important. Can we talk about um, cow's milk for a moment? Uh, a question we had, and I thought that we've got a, several actually about milk allergies, but one is how can parents protect infants from developing uh, an allergy to, to cow's milk, which I I guess is the most common. Uh, food allergy for children, and I'm not sure which one of you would like to take that. Uh, I'll take a shot. I'm, uh, sure. So first of all, I think it's a very, very important question because um, uh, cow's milk allergy actually is a concern, and babies are mainly fed milk. Therefore, that's the one food they're being fed, and all of a sudden, um, uh, you, you're having difficulties uh, feeding your, your baby. So um, allergies are on the increase, as Dr. Chacho has mentioned, a couple of things that we do know that seem to reduce your risk of uh, a risk of an allergy uh, manifesting or developing in an infant. Obviously, they encourage nursing, uh, breastfeeding, because that seems to be um, one of the most children who get breastfed tend to have fewer allergies than those who are not. They do have allergies, but the overall, if on a comparison basis, it seems to be less severe. There's a protective effect 
of breast milk. Then secondly, um, we now know about introducing foods a bit sooner because previously people delayed introducing a variety of foods when uh, children were much older, like nine or 10 months. But right now, between ages of four to six months, there's now a move to begin exposing um, infants to more foods. We know they won't eat a large amount, but just introducing a different texture and the process of also introducing a different food, that seems to have a protective effect. Are there good milk alternatives for children that uh, have the allergy? Uh, yes, yes, there are alternatives if a mother cannot nurse and a child gets diagnosed with a milk allergy, we end up feeding them with a pre-digested formula. These are formulas that are, have all the same protein and uh, nutrient levels as milk, but the protein is pre-digested, meaning that the protein is broken down into smaller fragments, which are unable to make the child develop an allergy manifestation. And there are different varieties of those formulas. Some are much more extensively um, uh, um, uh, pre-digested than others. And I would say all, all the, most of the time, I would say we're effective in nourishing the child. And obviously if the allergies persist, then they work with my colleague, Dr. Chacho, to figure out the extent of the allergies and whether desensitization is even an option. So Dr. Chacho, you spoke about uh, Palforzia just a moment ago. Is there any research that is indicating that that could expand to other types of, of nuts? Yes, absolutely. That's ongoing right now. Several other foods, in fact. Um, we have an egg desensitization pro um, uh, program open, and we are anticipating a, a multi-tree nut. So that would be things like walnuts, pecans, cashews, pistachios, um, yet this year. Uh, and uh, milk is certainly on the radar and will be coming soon. Um, we all already have some options for desensitization for some other foods. Um, so please contact the clinic if it's something that you're interested in hearing more about. That's great. Now the question from a viewer, what test is best to determine if a child has asthma or allergies? My daughter's two, year, two years old and takes Flovent daily, but uh, I feel the medication does not help control her symptoms which are frequent runny nose, itchy eyes, some cough, and uh, af particularly after running around or exercising. You know, I think the best testing uh, for the allergy component is something called skin prick testing, and this is where we take a, uh, a dilute concentration of actually pollens and things like dog dander or dust, and we just make a very small prick on a child's back. It doesn't break the skin, it doesn't drop blood, it doesn't really hurt, it's just a very small pinch feeling. And we watch it for the next 15 minutes. And if that turns into a hive, that gives us an indication that your child has some allergies. There's also an option to do blood testing. It's not quite as good as skin testing, but it's pretty good. And certainly in the age of COVID, um, we have been doing quite a bit of blood testing. We actually um, can mail lab slips to families and they can go to any lab they're comfortable with. And that can certainly give us um, some useful information. As far as asthma goes, there's um, a breathing test, but in the time of COVID, we actually have not figured out a workaround for this just yet. So most asthma testing is on hold um, for the immediate future. Now the question from a viewer or a request, can you discuss EOE and when formal scoping and testing is warranted? Don't know which one of you want to take that one. Uh, EOE, EOE basically is an abbreviation for eosinophilic esophagitis. Eosinophilic esophagitis is a form of food allergy that mainly affects the food pipe, the esophagus. That's the tube between your mouth and your stomach. When you swallow your food, uh, it goes across your chest through the food pipe called the esophagus. Now, in this condition, people have an allergy to something in their diet or something in the environment that causes inflammation in the esophagus. And when that happens, they have pain, they may be vomiting, uh, they don't wanna eat, and uh, that's how they come to attention. And uh, it's diagnosed based on a good history. Sometimes there may be a family member with uh, the same condition, but ultimately they may need to have a test called an endoscopy. An endoscopy is a camera test, which is like a special tube, which is done under sedation. The child gets sedated by an anesthetist who's experienced in doing that. And then we insert the scope in the mouth, through the back to the throat and down in the esophagus, and we can take a look and take a biopsy of it. So once again, um, uh, is one of the, there are many treatment options for it, but one of them obviously is a food elimination. And the importance of it obviously is that um, uh, it makes children have a lot of chest pain and vomiting, and uh, 
the treatment involves eliminating foods most of the time. Another viewer would like to know if you would recommend holding off on starting OIT during the COVID pandemic. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so far we have not during the COVID pandemic um, started OIT, although we have uh, several patients who are already on OIT. And just last week we started updosing again. And um, just in the next two weeks, we are planning to start, um, start new OIT again. And we're going to play it by ear. Um, there may be times when we have to stop and we can't updose for a month or two again. Um, but what um, we know from the literature is as long as your child is getting exposed to the food, that allergen, um, through the process of oral immunotherapy, that even if we can't go up on schedule, they're still going to get continued effects on their immune system. So it, it, I wouldn't think of it as a waste. Um, I think that it's still um, effective at... Uh, different concentrations. We're still going to shoot for that goal of, in the case of a peanut, a full peanut, um, but we may not be able to get there in a six-month time frame. It may take a little bit longer. Another question from a viewer. I'm not sure if my toddler should be tested for COVID-19 or if it's allergies. I've treated them with Zyrtec and it's helped with some congestion, but my toddler still struggles. Uh, this sounds like a, a, a good opportunity for at least a video visit and possibly bringing the child in, but I'll let one of you uh, answer that. Sure, I'll, I'll take that. I, I do think it's reassuring if Zyrtec helps. And um, in general, um, since we don't have treatments that will give to mildly ill patients with COVID at this time, um, there really isn't a strong need to actually get testing to prove you have COVID one way or the other. Um, as long as your child is breathing okay and you're able to control a temperature, if the temperature is involved, um, then it's okay to stay home and, and keep watching. Uh, of course, if your child um, is starting to struggle to breathe or develops a fever that you're having trouble controlling or is prolonged, by all means, please uh, make a visit right away. Um, but again, that, that fever is really uh, specific for an infection and not um, for allergies. So if you see a fever, I, I would not be suspicious of allergies. So what kind of symptoms uh, do you look for in newborns or babies that would indicate risk of, of sig significant allergies? And if you do see one of these symptoms, what, what do parents do? I'll take that. So um, uh, again, in babies um, who may present with, and that's again, it's an important question because it affects uh, their nutrition. But basically what typically happens is that um, uh, most babies, who, babies who ultimately develop a food allergy obviously have to get exposed to whatever they're allergic to. And the typical symptoms may be a baby who um, uh, is uh, having, um, uh, is very colicky and more so if they have any blood in their stool. For example, that's abnormal. Having blood in your stool is abnormal. Um, uh, that's an indication to us that the GI tract is being irritated by something. Other signs that um, uh, there may be an allergy to what they're being fed is that baby who is very hungry, comes for a feed, is fed, satisfied, then becomes very fussy and sometimes very gassy. And you can tell that something inside them is bothering them. And eventually they may spit up a lot or they may have a bowel movement then they get become very hungry again and you go through the same motions sometimes there are other signs of allergy in the baby like the baby may have a skin rash called eczema and again that's a rash which is easily diagnosed by your pediatrician because babies have a large variety of rashes so you need to have your pediatrician examine the child and verify what it is but if it is present it makes us increasingly suspect that this could be an allergy and also there may be a family history of an older sibling uh, or other family members who have dealt with allergies. That increases our index of suspicion. And uh, once we come to that understanding, the options involve changing the feeds. And many times when we are right, uh, the babies do so much better. Dr. Santango, Dr. Chacho, we are out of time. I appreciate both of you doing uh, this. You, you both did a wonderful job. We'll have another At the Forefront Live next week. Uh, and please remember to check out our Facebook page for our schedule of programs coming up in the future. Also, if you want more information about UChicago Medicine, take a look at our website at uchicagomedicine.org. If you need an appointment, you can give us a call at 888-824-0200. And remember, you can schedule your video visit by going to the website. There's also a very helpful video there that tells you exactly what you need to do and how to prepare. Thanks again for being with us today, and I hope you have a great week.